Welcome one, welcome all, whether you're watching live or uh, joining us another time to study. We want to thank you for the privilege that we can gather together and learn the events that will happen. So we're just looking at um, church and state in the context and um, in the future, what we usually call a uh, law is going to be passed based on Revelation 13, 15 to 17. It's called the Sunday law, which is commonly known in uh, Protestant circles, especially Seventh-day Adventists. So just briefly wanted to see that uh, Sunday law would have been passed in the 1888s. And let's understand what happened then. Because a similar scenario is going to build at one point in time. We don't know when. When God allows it, it's going to come to pass. So we're going to study about that. Let's um, pray before we understand this. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for the privilege you have given me help to put this together. Thank you for a uh, breath of life and counting among the living. For given cleanse, make me whole. Oh, Lord, give us understanding so that we can discern what has happened and what will happen eventually in the future. So talk to us. May Holy Spirit lead and guide. Take control of our devices. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So here we are at prophecylife.org, always learning from the past to understand the present and to prepare for the future. We always promote an outreach tool. If you want to use it, you can use it. It is a concise 40-page A5 size booklet uh, talking about the past, the present, and the future. In fact, there's a final events, a Bible chart, prophecy chart that is available on it or in it, and it's explained as well from the Bible and the pen of inspirations. So, if you want the electronic copy, it's uh, accessible to download on prophecylive.org. If you want the hard copy, get in touch with us and we will provide it to you. Enter the Ark of Hope is what I say week after week. And we need to remember that the great controversy is raging. All the hustle and bustle of activities on earth for almost 6,000 years is only because Satan wanted to be like God. And he deserves... Um, he thinks he deserves to be God. So we need to be mindful of who and what we choose. Satan is demanding and soon he will force people to worship him on, a, on his day, which is Sunday. If you want to worship God, who created heaven and earth and all that in them there is, you have to worship the creator God, and which he instituted seventh day Saturday at creation. Who will you choose? That's why we're studying, to understand and make an informed choice. And get into the ark is another statement. I keep saying week after week, because God is in his holy, most holy place, sitting on his throne, passing judgment. The foundation of his throne is the ark of the covenant, inside which is the law of God, based on which he governs the universe and even judges man and Satan and his host. Get into this ark. Health snippet, we give you week after week. We're going through some vegetables and uh, plant produce, so to say. And today we're looking at um, Akuzai bean. Now, uh, if you have any concern, you can seek medical advice. It's simply a legume and one of the legumes that are available. We are specifically picking on this. So you know that uh, Akuzai beans, as Akuzai beans are, the spelling is slightly variant, but both are the same. They're red beans or red moon beans. That's what sometimes it's identified as commonly. So like other types of beans and peas, they are part of the legume family. And there are at least 60 varieties of Azka beans. And they're grown in more than 30 countries, especially China. They are naturally gluten-free. And 100 grams, meaning 3.5 ounces portion of boiled Azka beans provides you with 128 calories, 7.5 grams of protein, 0 grams of fat, 0 grams of cholesterol, 25 grams of carbohydrates, 7.3 grams of fiber, 28 milligram calcium, 52 milligram magnesium, 168 milligram of phosphorus, and 532 milligram of potassium, etc. What are the benefits other than all those vitamins and minerals? It prevents cell damage. Akutza beans contain at least 29 different types of antioxidants which help prevent some types of cell damage. It also helps in weight loss. Exercise beans may help you lose weight. Heart health. It helps decrease total LDL or the bad cholesterol. 
what about anti aging study show that those eating kids are living longer and also what about reduced chance of birth defects 100 grams of serving of its beans provides with one third of the folate you need in a day also about muscle and bone strength calcium phosphorus potassium and magnesium are minerals that body needs to keep muscles working right and bones less breakable some uh, precautions here now uh, some people don't eat beans and legumes and all of this thinking of the uh, gas formation in the digestive system and the flatulence that occurs the best solution to that is soaking the beans for 12 hours which reduces the gas formation you will see the gas floating on the water after 12 hours so 100 grams of sweet and exa bean paste contains 34 grams of sugar so if you're concerned about consuming sugar watch out canned stuff and processed exa beans exa beans are used in various ways you can use them as sweet or savory dishes and are healthy substitutes for meat it's gluten free remember that and they add them to soups stews curries chilies salads and grain bowls or cook with kale or other vegetables they're very savory if you to enjoy it enjoy it this god's pharmacy any concerns seek medical advice another statement we keep saying or a question can we trust bible prophecy and we say yes and this is a repeat but i'm i'm impressed to repeat this ezekiel 20 verse 12 says moreover also i gave them my sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that i am the lord that sanctify them the seventh day sabbath that god instituted for man at creation and ratified it by putting in the law which existed before the creation of man hard copy given to moses on mount sinai is going to be a serious test and that is why i wanted us to read this it is a sign that god sanctifies us meaning take away all our sin when we surrender it all to him so prophecy is true so today we are studying the blair bill it's also known as the buckridge bill we're doing section 1 meaning there's another section to come so let us understand what happened here This pamphlet is a report of an argument made upon the National Sunday Bill introduced by Senator Blair in the 50th Congress. It is not however exactly the argument that was made before the Senate committee as there were so many interruptions in the course of my speech that it was impossible to make connect an argument upon a single point. Now this is written by um AT Jones. These are his statements. so by these questions etc my argument was not only forced to take a wider range than as intended when i began to speak but i was prevented from making the definite argument that i designed to present i do not speak of these interruptions and counter arguments by way of complaint but only to explain why this pamphlet is issued nevertheless it is a fact that while there were 18 speeches before mine occupying 3 hours in all of which together there were only 190 89 questions and counter arguments by all the members of the committee who were present i was interrupted by the chairman alone 169 times in 90 minutes as may be seen by the official report of the hearing and that's the reference where you can find it so a national sunday law is a question of national interest While it is true that the Sunday Rest Bill did not become a law, the legislation having died with the expiration of the 50th Congress, it is also true that those who work for the introduction and passage of that bill are now laying plans to have another National Sunday Bill introduced as soon as possible in the 51st Congress. That's what is written, and will do in all this their power to secure its enactment into law. the scope that has given to the subject by the questions asked of me by the senate committee has opened the way for a somewhat exhaustive treatment of the subject these questions being raised by united states senators men of national affairs show that a wider circulation of this matter is not out of place so the subject is worthy of the careful attention of the whole american people the principles of the american constitution the proper relationship between religion and state and the distinction between moral and civil law and the in 
inalienable civil and religious rights of men. These are questions that never should become secondary in the mind of any American citizen. So an eminent American jurist has justly observed that in a government of the people, there is no safety except in an enlightened public opinion based on individual intelligence. Constitutional provisions against the encroachments of the religion upon the civil power are safeguards only so long as the intelligence of the people shall recognize the truth that no man can allow any legislation in behalf of the religion or the religious observance in which he himself believes without forfeiting his own religious freedom. So in enlarging as I have upon the matter presented in the original hearing, the meaning or intention of any statement has not been changed in the slightest degree. The argument is submitted to the American people with the honest hope that they will give thoughtful consideration to the principles involved. The positions taken will bear the severest test of every form of just criticism. So the bill proposed by Senator Blair and upon which the argument was made is as follows. So this is the 50th Congress, first session is 2983. So in the Senate of the United States, 21 May 1888, Mr. Blair introduced the following bill, which was read twice and referred to the Committee on Education and Labor. A bill to secure to the people the enjoyment of the first day of the week commonly known as the Lord's Day as the day of rest and to promote its observance as a day of religious worship. So it's like this. Be it enacted by the state and house of representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled that no person or corporation or agent, servant or employee of any person or corporation shall perform or authorize to be performed any secular work, labor or business to the disturbance of others. Works of necessity, mercy and humanity expected, nor shall any person engage in any play, game or amusement or recreation to the disturbance of others on the first day of the week, commonly known as the lost day or during any part thereof in any territory, district, vessel or place subject to the exclusive jurisdiction of the United States, nor shall it be lawful for any person or corporation to receive pay for labor or service performed or rendered in the violation of this section. So, it continues in section 2, that no mails or mail letter shall hereafter be transported in time of peace or any land postal route, nor shall any mail matter be collected, assorted, handled or delivered during any part of the first day of the week provided that whenever any letter shall relate to a work of necessity or mercy or shall concern the health, life and disease of any person and the fact shall be plainly stated upon the face of the envelope containing the same, the Postmaster General shall provide for the transportation of such letter. Section C, so 3, I mean, that the prosecution of the commerce between the states and with the Indian tribes, the same not being work of necessity, mercy or humanity, by the transportation of persons or property by land or water in such as to interfere with the disturb the people in the employment of the first day of the week or any portion thereof as a day of rest from labor and same not being labor of necessity, mercy or humanity or its observance as a day of religious worship is hereby prohibited and any person or corporation or the agent or employee of any person or corporation who shall willfully violate this section shall be punished by a fine of not less than 10 or more than $1,000. And no service performed in the prosecution of such prohibited commerce shall be lawful, nor shall any compensation be re revocable or be paid for the same. Section 4. That all military and naval drills, masters and parades, not in time of active service, or immediate preparation thereafter of soldiers, sailors, marines, cadets of the United States on the first day of the week, except assemblies for the due and orderly observance of religious worship, or hereby prohibited. Nor shall an unnecessary labor be performed or permitted in the military or naval service of the United States on the Lord's Day. Section 5. That it shall be unlawful to pay or to receive payment or wages in any manner of service rendered 
or for labor performed or for transportation of persons or of property in violation of the provisions of this act nor shall any action lie for the recovery thereof and when so paid whether in advance or otherwise the same may be recovered back by whosoever shall first sue for the same section 6 that labor or service performed and rendered on the first day of the week is consequence of accident disaster or unavoidable delays in making the regular connections upon postal routes and routes of travel and transportation the preservation of perishable and exposed property and the regular and necessary transportation and delivery of articles of food in condition for healthy use and such transportation for short distances from one state, district or territory into another state, district or territory as by local laws shall be declared to be necessary for the public good, shall not be deemed violations of this act, but the same shall be construed so far as possible to secure to the whole people rest from toil during the first day of the week and their mental and moral culture and the religious observance of the Sabbath day. Now, Reverend A. H. Lewis, Doctor of Divinity, representative of the Seventh-day Baptist, had spoken and asked that a section be added to the bill granting exemption to observers of the seventh day. But in answering the questions that were asked by the chairman, Mr. Lewis, compromised his position and was followed soon after by Dr. Hendrick Johnson of Chicago, who remarked that Dr. Lewis had given his whole case away. This is what is referred to in my introductory remarks to the effect that we did not intend to give our case away. So now the argument of Alonzo T. Jones before the Senate committee in Washington, D.C. Now, Senator Blair is presenting his case. There are gentlemen present who wish to be heard in opposition to the bill. Professor Alonzo T. Jones of Battle Creek College, Michigan, is one of those who have spoken to me in regard to it. And will you not state, Professor Jones, that your desire is? I have no doubt that we can obtain leave of the Senate to sit during the session to today. It is exceedingly desirable to go on with this hearing and complete it now. How, much, how would such an arrangement comport with your con convenience? First, state please whom you represent and your reasons for desiring to be heard. Now, Mr. Jones, this is A.T. Jones, is responding to say, Mr. Chairman, I represent the people known as Seven Day Adventists. It is time we have been entirely ignored by the other side. The very small sect, as they said, stated it, of Seven Day Baptists has been recognized. But we are more than three times their number and many times their power in the real force of our work. We have organizations in every state and territory in the Union. We have the largest printing house in Michigan, the largest printing house in the Pacific Coast, the largest sanitarium in the world, a college in California, and one in Michigan as an academy in Massachusetts, a printing established in Basel, Switzerland, one in Christiana, Norway, and in one Melbourne, Australia. Our mission work has enlarged until, besides embracing the great part of Europe, it has also extended nearly around the world, and we desire a hearing with the consent of the committee. Now, Senator Blair responds, where do you reside? Mr. Jones, at present in Michigan, my home for the past four years has been in California. I am now teaching history in Battle Creek College, Michigan. I must say in Justice to myself and also in behalf of the body which I represent, that we dissent almost wholly, I might say wholly, from the position taken by the representative of the Seventh-day Baptists. I knew the instant that Dr. Lewis stated that he did hear that he had given his case away. We have not given our case away, Senators. Do not we expect to give it away. We expect to do deeper than any have gone at this hearing, both upon the principles and upon the facts, as well as upon the logic of the facts. Now, Senator Blair says, this matter is all familiar to me, to you. You are a professor of history. You can, you, can you not go on this afternoon? Mr. Jones, yes, I can have a little space between now and this afternoon to get my papers together. And I have some references to read that I did not bring with me this morning. Senator Blair, very well. Senator Blair, you have a full hour 
Professor, it is now half past one. Now, Mr. Jones says, there are three particular lines in which I wish to conduct the argument. First, the principles upon which we stand. Second, the historical view. And third, the practical aspect of the question. So the principle upon which we stand is that civil government is civil and has nothing to do in the matter of legislation with religious observance in any way. The basis of this is found in the words of Jesus Christ in Matthew 22, 21. When the Pharisees asked whether it was lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not, he replied, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. So in this the Savior certainly separated that which pertains to Caesar from that which pertains to God. So we are not to render to Caesar that which pertains to God, and we are not to render to God by Caesar that which is God's. Now Senator Blair is saying, not the thing due to Caesar is due to God also. Mr. Jones, no, sir. If that be so, then the Savior did entangle himself in his talk, the very thing which they wanted him to do. The record says that they sought how they might entangle him in his talk. Having drawn the distinction which he has between that which belongs to Caesar and that which belongs to God, if it be true that the same things belong to both, then he did entangle himself in his talk. And where is the force in his words which command to render Caesar that which belongs to Caesar and to God that which belongs to God? Senator Blair, it is not a requirement of the gods that we render to Caesar that which is due to Caesar? Yes, Jones replies. Then Senator Blair says, if Caesar is society, and the Sabbath is required for the good of society. Does not God require us to establish the Sabbath for the good of society? And if society makes a law accordingly, is it not binding? Mr. Jones, it is for a good of society that men shall be Christians, but it is not good in the provision of the state to make Christians. For the state to undertake to do so would not be for the benefit of society. It never has been, and it never can be. Senator Blair, do you not confuse this matter? A thing may be required for the good of society and for that very reason be in accordance with the will of the command of God. God issues these commands for the good of society, does he not? God does not give us commands that have no relation to the good of society. Mr. Jones replies, his commands are for the good of man. Senator Blair says, man is society and it is made up of individual men, Mr. Jones. But in that which God has issued to man for the good of men, he has given those things which pertain solely to man's relationship to his God. And he has also given things which pertain to man's relationship to his fellow men. With those things in which our duty pertains to our fellow men, civil government can have something to do. Senator Blair says, man would obey God in obeying civil society. So Jones responds, I will come to that point. In the things which pertain to our duty to God, with the individual's right of serving God as one's conscience dictates, society has nothing to do. But in the formation of society, there are certain rights surrendered to the society by the individual without which society could not be organized. Senator Blair, that is not conceded. When was this doctrine of a compact in society made? It is the philosophy of an infidel. Mr. Jones replies, it is made whenever you find men together. Senator Blade, did you and I ever agree to it? Did it bind us before we were compass mentis? Mr. Jones, certainly. Civil government is an ordinance of God. Senator Blade, then it is not necessary an agreement of man? Mr. Jones, yes, sir. It springs from the people. Senator Blair, as to the compact in society that is talked about, it is not conceded that it is a matter of personal and individual agreement. Society exists altogether independent of the violation of those who enter into it. However, I shall not interrupt you further. I only did this because of our private conversation in which I thought you labored under a fallacy in your fundamental proposition that would lead all the way through your argument. I suggested that ground, and that is all. Mr. Jones, I think the statement of the Declaration of Independence is true that governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. Senator Blair, 
I do not controvert that. Mr. Jones, of all men in the world, Americans ought to be the last to deny the social compact theory of civil government. On board the Mayflower, before the Pilgrim Fathers ever foot, set foot on these shores, the following was written. And it reads, In the name of God, Amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of a dread, uh, sovereign Lord King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France and Ireland, King, Defender of the Faith, etc., having undertaken of the glory of God and the advance on the Christian faith and the honor of our King and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. Do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body, politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid, and by virtue thereof, do enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and officers from time to time, as shall be thought most need and convenient for the general good of the colony, until which we promise all due submission and obedience. In witness hereof, we have hitherto subscribed our names at Cape Cod, the 11th of November, in the reign of our sovereign Lord King James of England, France and Ireland, the 18th and of Scotland, uh, 54th and Anna Domini, 1620. So the next American record is that of the fundamental orders of Connecticut, 1638 to 1639, and it reads as follows. For as much as it hath pleased the Almighty God by the wise disposition of the divine providence, so that order and dispose of things that we, the inhabitants of the residence of Windsor and Hartford and Withersfield, are now cohabitating and dwelling, and upon the river of Connecticut and lands thereunto adjoining, and well knowing where a people are gathered together, the word of God requires that to maintain the peace and union of such people, there should be an orderly and decent government established according to God, to order and dispose the affairs to the people at all sections as occasion shall require. Now, do therefore associate the convince the ourselves to be as one public state or commonwealth and do for ourselves and our successors such as shall adjoin to us at any time hither, to, hither thereafter. Enter into combination and confederation together, etc. So, and sir, the first constitution of your own state, 1784, in its Bill of Rights declares, number one, all men are born equally free and independent thereof, and all government of right originates from the people, is founded in consent and instituted for the general good. Number three, when men enter into the state of society, they surrender some of their natural rights to that society in order to ensure the protection of others and without such an equivalent and surrender is void. Number four, among the natural rights, some are in their very nature unalienable because no equivalent can be received for them of this kind are the rights of conscience. And in part two of that some same constitution, under the division of the form of government are these words. The people inhabiting the territory formerly called the province of New Hampshire do they hereby solemnly and mutually agree with each other to form themselves into a free, sovereign, and independent body, politic, or state by the name of the state New Hampshire? So in the Constitution of New Hampshire of 1792, these articles are repeated word for word. They remain there without alteration in a single letter under the ratification of 1852 and also under the ratification of 1877. So consequently, sir, the very state which sends you to this capital is founded upon the very theory which you here deny. This is the doctrine of the Declaration of Independence. It is the doctrine of the scripture, and therefore we hold it to be eternally true. Their sound and genuine American principles, civil governments deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed and the inalienability of the rights of conscience, and these are the principles asserted and maintained by Seventh-day Adventists. Now, Senator Blair says, but society is behind the government which society creates. Mr. Jones says, certainly, all civil government springs from the people 
and I care not in what form it is. Senator Blair, that is all agreed to. Now, Mr. Jones, but the people I care not how many there are have no right to invade your relationship to God or mine. That rests between the individual and God. Through faith in Jesus Christ and a Savior has made this distinction between that which pertains to Caesar and to that which is God's. When Caesar exacts of men that which pertains to God, then Caesar is out of his place. And in so far as he is obeyed there, God is denied. So when Caesar, meaning civil government, exacts of men that which is God's, he demands that does not belong to him. In so doing, Caesar upsets the place of the prerogative of God. And every man who regards God or his own rights before God will disregard all such interference on the part of Caesar. So this argument, apologies, this argument is confirmed by the Apostles' commentary upon Christ's words in Romans 13, 1 to 9, in, is written like this. This is Romans 13, 1 to 9, and it says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God, and whosoever therefore resisted the power, resisted the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore he must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For this cause pay ye tribute also for your God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their Jews tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor, and owe no one anything but to love one another, for he that loveth one another hath fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love their neighbor as thyself. That's Romans 13, 1 to 9. So it is easy to see that this scripture is but an exposition of Christ's words. Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's. So in the Savior's command to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, there is plenty of recognition of the fruitful rightfulness of civil government and that civil government has claims upon which we are in duty bound to recognize and that there are things which duty requires us to render to the civil government. So this scripture in Romans 13 simply states, the same thing in other words. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Again, the Savior's words are in answer to a question concerning tribute. They said to him, it is lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not. That's Romans 13, 6. And refers to the same thing saying, for this cause, they eat tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon it, this very thing. So in answer to the question of the Pharisees about the tribute, Jesus said, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's. That's found in Romans 13, 7. Taking up the same thought says, Render therefore to all their dues. Tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. So these references make positive that which we have stated that this position of scripture as found in Romans 13, 1 to 9 is a divine commentary upon the words in, of Christ in Matthew 22, 17 to 21. So the passage refers first to civil government, the higher powers, the powers that be. Next, it speaks of rulers as bearing the sword and attending upon matters of tribute. Then it commands to render tribute to whom tribute is due and says, Oh, no, man, anything. But to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Then he refers to the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth commandments and says, It is 
there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So there are other commandments of this same law to which Paul refers. There are the four commandments of the first table of the law. The commandments which say, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven in the likeness of anything. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Then there is the other commandment in which are briefly comprehended all these. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all the heart, with all the soul, with all the mind, and with all thy strength. So Paul knew full well that these commandments, why then did he say, if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love the neighbor as thyself. Because he was writing concerning the principles set forth by the Savior, which relate to our duties to civil government. So our duties under civil government pertain solely to the government and to our fellow men. Because the powers of civil government pertain solely to men in their relation one to another and to the government. But the Savior's words in the same connection entirely separate that which pertains to God from that which pertains to civil government. So the things which pertain to God are not to be rendered to civil government and to the powers that be. Therefore, Paul, although knowing full well that there are other commandments said, if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That is, if there be any other commandment which comes into the relation between man and civil government, it is comprehended in this saying that he shall love his neighbor as himself. Thus showing conclusively that the powers that be, though ordained of God, are so ordained simply in things pertaining to the relation of man with his fellow man and in those things alone. So, further he can continues to say that as is this divine record of the duties that men owe to the powers that be, there is no reference whatsoever to the first table of the law. It therefore follows that the powers that be, although ordained of God, have nothing whatsoever with the relations which men bear toward God. So as the Ten Commandments contain the whole duty of man, and as in the enumeration here given of the duties that men owe to the powers that be, there is no mention of any of the things contained in the first table of the law. It follows that none of the duties enjoined in the first table of the law of God do men owe to the powers that be. That is to say, again, that the powers that be, although ordained of God, are not ordained of God in anything pertaining to a single duty enjoined in any one of the first four of the Ten Commandments. These are duties that men owe to God, and with those, the powers that be can of right have nothing to do because Christ has commanded to render unto God, not to Caesar, nor by Caesar, which that which is God's. Therefore, as in his comment upon the principles that Christ established, Paul has left out of the account the first four commandments, so we deny forever the right of any civil government to legislate in anything that pertains to man's duty to God under the first four commandments. This Sunday bill does propose to legislate in regard to the Lord's day. If it is the Lord's day, we are to render it to the Lord and not to Caesar. When Caesar exalts it, exacts it of us, he is exacting what does not belong to him and is demanding of us that which he should have nothing to do. So, Senator Blair now says, he responds, would it answer your objection in that regard if instead of saying the Lord's Day, we should just say Sunday? And Mr. Jones, no, sir, because the underlying principle, the sole basis of Sunday is ecclesiastical and le legislation in regard to it is ecclesiastical legislation. I shall come more fully to the question you ask presently. So now do you now, do not misunderstand us on this point. We are Seventh-day Adventists, but if this bill were in favor of enforcing the observance of the seventh day as the Lord's day, we would oppose it just as much as we oppose it as it is now. For the reason that civil government has nothing to do with what we owe to God or whether we owe anything or not or whether we pay it 
or not. So allow me again to refer to the words of Christ to emphasize this point. At that time, the question was upon the subject of tribute, whether it is lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not. So in answering the question, Christ established this principle. Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's and unto God the things which are God's. So that tribute money was Caesar's. It bore his image and superscription. It was to be rendered to him. Now it is a question of rendering Sabbath observance. And it is a perfectly legitimate and indeed a necessary question to ask right here. Is it lawful to render the Lord's Day observance to Caesar? The reply may be in his own words. Show me the Lord's Day whose image and superscription does it bear. The Lord's, to be sure. This very bill, which is under discussion here today, declares it to be the Lord's Day. Then the words of Christ apply to this. Bearing the image and superscription of the Lord, therefore render to the Lord the things that are the Lord's and to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. It does not bear the image and superscription of Caesar. It does not belong to him. It is not to be rendered to him. Again, take the institution under the word Sabbath. It is lawful to render Sabbath observance to Caesar or not. Show us the Sabbath. Whose image and superscription does it bear? So the commandment of God says, it is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. It bears his image and superscription and his only. It belongs wholly to him. Caesar can have nothing to do with it. It does not belong to Caesar. Its observance cannot be rendered to Caesar, but only to God. For the commandment is, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. If it is not kept holy, it is not kept at all. Therefore, belonging to God, bearing his superscription and not that of Caesar, according to Christ's commandment, is to be rendered only to God. Because we are to render to God that which is God's and the Sabbath is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Sabbath observance, therefore, or Lord's day observance, which ever you may choose to call it whenever you can be rendered to Caesar. And Caesar never can demand it without demanding that which belongs to God or without putting himself in the place of God and observing the prerogative of God. So therefore, we say that if this bill were framed in behalf of the real Sabbath of the Lord, the seventh day, the day which we observe, if this bill proposed to promote his observance or to compel men to do work upon that day, we would oppose it. It just as strongly as we oppose it now. And I would stand here at this table and argue precisely as I'm arguing against this. And upon the same principle, the principle established by Jesus Christ, that which is God's, the civil government never can of right have anything to do. So the duty rests solely between man and God. And if any man does not render to God, he is responsible only to God. And his failure or refusal to render it to God or any other power that undertakes to punish that man for his failure or refusal to render to God, what is God's? Put itself in the place of God. So any government which attempts it sets itself against the word of Christ and therefore anti-Christian. This Sunday bill proposes to have this government do just that thing. And therefore I say without any reflection upon the author of the bill, this national Sunday bill which is under discussion here today, is anti-Christian. But in Christ, in saying this, I am not singling out this contemplated law as worse than all other Sunday laws in the world. There never was a Sunday law that was not anti-Christian. And there never can be one that is not to be anti-Christian. Now, Senator Blair says, you oppose all the Sunday laws of the country then? Mr. Jones says, yes, sir. Senator Blair says, are you against all Sunday laws? Mr. Jones, yes, sir. We are against every Sunday law that was ever made in this world from the first enacted by Constantine at, to this one, now proposed. And we would be equally against the Sabbath law if it were proposed, for that would be anti-Christian too. Senator Blair, state and national alike? Mr. Jones, state and national, sir. I shall give you historical reasons presently and the facts upon which these things stand and I hope they will receive consideration. Then he quotes, George Washington, I believe, is yet held in some respectful consideration. He is by 
the seventh advantage at least as he said every man who conducts himself as a good citizen is accountable alone to god for his religious faith and is to be protected in worshiping god according to the dictates of his own conscience and so should be should we be protected as long as we are law abiding citizens there are no reason sorry there are no saloon keepers among us we are a body of prohibitors prohibitions and as for the principles of christian temperance we conscientiously practice them in short you will find no people in this country or in the world more peaceable and law abiding than we endeavor to be we teach the people according to the scripture to be subject to the powers that be and we teach them that the highest duty of the christian citizen is strictly obey the law to obey it from fear of punishment but to obey respect for governmental authority and out of respect for god and conscience towards him Now, senator blair says that is the common mormon argument so the mormons say their institution is a matter of religious belief everybody concedes their right to believe in mormonism but when they come to the point of practicing it will it not be to the disturbance of others mr jones replies i should have come to that even though you had not asked the question but you have introduced it i will notice it now my argument throughout is that the civil government can never have anything to do with men's duties under the first four of the 10 commandments and this is the argument embodied in washington's words these duties pertain solely to god now polygamy is adultery but adultery is not a duty that men owe to god in any way much less does it come under any of the first four commandments so this comes within the inhibitions of the second table of the law of god now the commandments embracing duty to our neighbor how men should conduct themselves toward their fellow men civil government must decide that is the very purpose of its existence consequently the practice of polygamy lying wholly within this realm is properly subject to the jurisdiction of civil government my argument does not in the least decree countenance of the principles of mormonism nor can it fairly be made to do so i know that it is offered as a very ready objection but those who offer it as an objection and as an argument against the principles upon which we stand thereby make adultery a religious practice but against all such objection and argument i maintain that adultery is not in any sense a religious practice it is not only highly irreligious but is essentially uncivil and because it is uncivil the civil power has as much right to blot it out out of it as to punish murder or thieving or perjury or any other uncivil thing moreover we deny that the honest occupations of any day of the week or at any time whatever can ever properly be classed with adultery so there are these people who believe in community of property in this world suppose they base their principles of having all things in common upon the apostolic example very good they have the right to do that everyone who sells his property and puts it into common fund has a right to do that if he chooses but suppose this man in carrying out that principle and in claiming that it is religious ordinance were to take into consent their property or mine into their community then what the state forbids it it does not forbid the exercise of their religion but it protects your property and mine and in exercising its prerogative of the protection it forbids theft and in forbidding theft the state never asks any question as to whether thieving is a religious practice so also as to polygamy which is practiced among the mormons but let us consider this in another view so in it is a, in it is every man's right in this country or anywhere else to worship an idol if he chooses that idol embodies his conviction that god is he can worship only according to his convictions it matters not what form of idol may have he has the right to worship it anywhere in the world therefore in the united states but suppose that in the worship of that god he attempts to take the life of one of his fellow men and offer it to a human sacrifice now the civil government exists for the protection of life liberty and prosperity etc and it must punish that man for his attempt upon the life of his fellow man 
So the civil law protects man's life from such exercise of any one's religion, but in punishing the offender and the state does not consider the question of his religion at all. It would punish him just the same if he made no pretensions of worship or to religion. It punishes him for his invisible incivility. So the, for this attempt of murder, not punishes him for his religion. I repeat, the question of religion is not considered by the state. The sole question is, did he threaten the life of his fellow man? Civil government must protect its citizens. And this is strictly within Caesar's jurisdiction. It comes within the line of duties, which the scripture shows to pertain to our neighbor and with it Caesar has to do. So, therefore, it is true that the state can never be of right legislate in regard to any man's religious faith or in relation to anything in the first four commandments of the Decalogue. But if in the exercise of his religious convictions under the first four commandments, a man invades the rights of his neighbor as to life, family, property, or character, then the civil government says that it is unlawful. Why? Because it is irreligious or immoral. Not at all, but because it is uncivil and for that reason only. It can never be proper for the state to ask any question as to whether his actions are religious or not. The sole question must ever be, is the action civil or uncivil? Senator Blair now responds. Now apply that right to this case, to the institution of the Sabbath among men for the good of men. Now Mr. Jones says, very good. We will consider that. Here are persons who are keeping Sunday. It is their right to work on every other day of the week. It is their right to work on that day. If they desire that they are keeping that day, recognizing it as the Sabbath. Now, while we, while they are doing that which is their right, here are other people who are keeping Saturday and others who are keeping Friday. The Mohammedans recognize Friday. But we will confine ourselves to those who keep Saturday, the seventh day, as the Sabbath. So those who keep Sunday and who want legislation for that day ask that other people shall be forbidden to work on Sunday because they say it disturbs their rest, it disturbs their worship, etc. And they claim that their rights are not properly protected. So do they really believe that in principle, let us see, they will never admit that at any rate, I have never yet found one of them who would, that their work on Saturday disturb the rest or the worship of the man who rests on Saturday. If their work on Saturday does not disturb the Sabbath rest or the worship of the man who keeps Saturday, then upon what principle it is that our work on Sunday disturb the rest of those who keep Sunday? I have never found one on that side yet who would admit the principle. If their work does not disturb our rest and our worship, our work cannot disturb their rest or their worship. More than this, in a general Sunday convention held in San Francisco at which I was present, there was a person who spoke on this very question. Said he, there are some people and a good many of them in this state who do not believe in Sunday laws and who keep Saturday as the Sabbath. But he said he, the majority must rule. The vast majority of the people do keep Sunday. Their rights must be respected and they have a right to enact it into law. I arose and said, suppose the seven day people were in the majority and they should go to legislate and ask for a law to compel you to keep Saturday out of respect to their rights. Would you consider it right? There was a murmur all over the house. No. So Senator Blair says, upon what ground did they say no? Mr. Jones, that is what I should like to know. They were not logical. Their answer shows that there is no ground in justice nor in right for their claim that the majority should rule in matters of conscience. Senator Blair now says, that does not follow. It, at least it does not strike me that it follows. The majority has a right to rule in that pertains to the regulation of society. And if Caesar regulates society, then the majority has a right in this country to say that we shall render to Caesar. Mr. Jones replies, very good. 
but the majority has no right to say what we shall render to God, nor has it any right to say that we shall render to Caesar that which is God's. So in 999 out of every 1,000 people in the United States kept the Sabbath, that is Saturday, and I deemed it my right and I made it my choice to keep Sunday. They would have not right to compel me to rest on Saturday. Senator Blair says, in other words, you take the ground that for the good of society, irrespective of the religious aspect of the question, society may not require abstinence from labor on Sabbath if it disturbs others. Mr. Jones, as to its disturbing others, I have proved that it does not. The body of your question states my position exactly. Senator Blair now, you are logical that all the way through that there shall be no Sabbath. This question has passed me to ask, is the speaker also opposed to all the laws against blasphemy? Now, Mr. Jones, yes, sir. But not a, because blasphemy is not wrong, but because civil government cannot define blasphemy nor punish it. Blasphemy pertains to God and it is an offense against him and it is a sin against him. Senator Blair, suppose the practice of it in society at large is hurtful to society. Mr. Jones, that will have to be explained. How is it hurtful to society? Senator Blair, suppose it is hurtful to society in this way. A belief in the existence of God and reverence for the creator and a cultivation of that sentiment in society is for the good of society, is in fact the basis of all law and restraint. And if Almighty, who knows everything, or is supposed to do, and has the power, all power, and has no right to restrain us, is it difficult to see how we can restrain each other? Excuse me. Mr. Jones, he has the right to restrain us. He does restrain us. Senator Blair, to commonly blaspheme and deride the ridicule of the Almighty would, of course, have a tendency to bring up the children who are soon to be the state in an absolute disregard of him and his authority. Blasphemy, as I understand it, is that practice which brings the creator into contempt and ridicule among his creatures. Mr. Jones, that is blasphemy here, would not be blasphemy in China and many other countries. Senator Blair, we are not dealing with pagan communities. A regulation that may be appropriate in a pagan community would not answer men in the Christian community. Do you mean that there is no such thing as blasphemy? Mr. Jones, no, I do not mean that. Senator Blair, the chairman hardly believes in any God, whatever, at least in no such God as we do. Taking our God and this Christian institution of ours, what do you understand blasphemy to be? Mr. Jones, there are many things that the scriptures show to be blasphemy. Senator Blair, the power of the law has undertaken in various states to say that certain things are blasphemy. Mr. Jones, precisely. But if the law proposes to define blasphemy and punish it, why does it not go to the depth of it and define all and punish all? Senator Blair, perhaps it may not go as far as it ought. You say you are opposed to all laws against blasphemy, cursing and swearing. Mr. Jones, in relation to any one of the first four commandments, he says. The Senator Palmer now comes in, another third person. Suppose that what is defined as blasphemy in the statutes of the several states should detract from the observance of the law and regard to it would you regard laws against it as being improper? Mr. Jones responds, Under the principle that the scripture lays down, no legislation in any way can be proper in regard to the first four commandments. There may be many ways in which we would appear very appropriate for civil government to do this or to do that. But when you have entered upon such legislation, where will you stop? Senator Palmer, Abstaining from blasphemy is a part of education of the youth of the country. Mr. Jones, that is true. If you are properly educated, they will never blaspheme. Senator Palmer, we pass laws for the education of the youth. The question is whether abstinentism from blasphemy could not be included in the scope of education. Take it on that ground. Mr. Jones, idolatry, the couchousness is idolatry is no more than a violation of the first commandment. 
Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. And if the state can forbid the violation of the third commandment and the fourth, why may it not forbid the violation of the first and the second? And in that case, supplant God at once and establish an earthly theocracy. That is the only logical outcome. Senator Blair, consciousness is a state of mind. But when it becomes practiced by stealing, taking from another without consideration, the law intervenes. Mr. Jones, certainly. Senator Palmer, there is an infection in blasphemy or in consciousness. For instance, if one conscious man is a neighbor in a neighborhood, should infuse the whole neighborhood with consciousness to such an extent that all would become thieves, then consciousness would be a proper subject of legislation. Mr. Jones, never. You forbid the theft, not the consciousness. You cannot invade the condition of a mind in which lies the consciousness. Senator Blair, we do not say that we must invade the condition of mind, but society has a right to make regulations because those regulations are essential to the good of society. Society by a major vote establishes regulation and we have to obey what is settled by the majority. Mr. Jones, how shall it be discovered what is blasphemy? As it is only an offense against God. So in the Puritan theocracy of New England, our historian Bancroft says that the highest offense in the catalog of crimes was blasphemy or what a jury should call blasphemy. Senator Blair, but the law was behind the jury and said that the practice should be punished. If a jury of 12 men said that one had committed the overt act, then it could be punished. It was the majority who made the law. And the jury only found the question of fact after the law had been violated. The jury did not make the law. This is the question as to making the law. Mr. Jones, it is not wholly a question only of making the law. The question is whether the law is right when it is made. There is a limit to the lawmaking power, and that limit is the line which Jesus Christ has drawn. So the government has no right to make any law relating to the things that pertain to God, or offenses against God, or religion, and it has nothing to do with religion. So blasphemy, according to Judge Cooley, in his constitutional limitations, he writes, is purposefully using words concerning the supreme being calculated and designed to impair and destroy the reverence, respect and confidence due to him as the intelligent creator, governor and judge of the world. A bad motive must exist and there must be a willful, malicious attempt to lessen men's reverence for the deity or the accepted religion. So it is seen at a glance that this comes from the old English system of statutes regulating offenses against God and religion. That is where this statute is placed in every system of civil law. It could not be placed anywhere else. But offenses against God are to be answered for only at his tribunal and with religion or offenses against it. The civil power has nothing to do. It is a perversion of the functions of civil government to have it made a party to religious controversies. It will have ample excise for its power and jurisdiction to keep religious disputants as well as other people civil without allowing itself ever to become a partisan in religious disputes and the conservator of religious dogmas. So, but according to Judge Cooley's definition, blasphemy is an attempt to lessen men's reverence, but only for the deity, but for the accepted religion as well. But any man in this wide world has the right to lessen man's reverence to the accepted religion. And if he thinks the religion to be wrong. Consequently, as I said a moment ago, that which would be counted blasphemy here would not be counted blasphemy in China. And that which is the strictest adherence of the word of God and the faith of Jesus Christ here is necessarily blasphemy in China or in Turkey or in Russia. A man who preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ in China commits blasphemy under this definition. He does not make a willful attempt to lessen men's reverence for their accepted religion or for the deity's recognition in their religion. He had to do so if he is ever to get them to believe in Christ and the religion of Christ. He has to bring them to the place where 
they will have no reverence for their deities or for their accepted religion before they can be accept the religion of Jesus Christ. So it is the same way in Turkey or any other Mohammedan country or any other heathen country. Whenever the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached in any Mohammedan or heathen country, it is blasphemy under this definition because its sole object is not only to lessen men's reverence for their deities and for their accepted religion, but to turn them wholly from it and if possible to obliterate it from their minds. So, as we look at the discourse, there's a choice to make. Because this push is going to come. People are going to argue against what the direct word of God says. Love God, meaning the first four commandments. Love fellow men, the next six commandments. And the first four is for God to deal with. And the next six is for man to deal with. Who will we choose? Whether we'll choose the law of the land or the law of God. The law of the land is only influenced by the devil, Satan. The choice is to be made. Who will you choose? The devil has come down onto you having great thought because you know that he had a short time. Jesus is saying, other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring and they shall hear my voice and they shall be one fold and one shepherd. And my recommendation is enter the ark of hope. The ark of hope is the ark of the covenant inside which is the law of God. That is the basis of God's judgment. Right now, Jesus is sitting and passing judgment. We don't know when our names will come upon. And therefore, it is good to keep his law today. And he's standing at the door of everyone's heart and knocking. And he says, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. So if you have Jesus, hold on to him. If you don't have Jesus, I recommend this Jesus to you. Because he's coming soon to take everyone who reconciled with him. To be with him forever. No more sickness, no more pain, no more sorrow. All joy and happiness and forever. No more aches and pains, no more surgeries, no more hospitals. What a life that will be. Whether people like it or not, whether people are ready or not, whether people believe it or not, one day soon, Jesus is going to come. My final question is, are you ready to meet Jesus? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for helping us do the study. Thank you for to understand what was happening in the past because you have said this will happen again, especially just before you come. And we are living in those days where there's a possibility that this can happen. Oh Lord, open our eyes that we may see you and open our ears that we may hearken to the your voice. May your Holy Spirit direct us in the paths of righteousness by your grace and mercy. Therefore, uh, prepare us, O Lord, so that when our names are looked upon, we could rejoice and enter into your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, one. Thank you all for joining and studying with us. May God be with you all and God bless.